Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. If we have anybody new among us, a special welcome to you. I realize it can be a, a challenge to get up and, and come to people, a group of people you don't know, so thanks for doing that. If you are new, after the service at, at either exit, we'll have a, a greeter with a bag of, a basket of goodie bags. If you're new, claim your goodie bag. It has information about the church and a gift for you as well. We're all here because God is on a mission to save the world. And God's mission to save the world is through sending Jesus Christ to welcome us into relationship with God. Also to transform us in the image of Jesus Christ. We'll be more like him so we can go out into this world and share his love, share his good news. God's mission is to transform the world one person at a time and we are a part of that mission. Around here we call that Know Christ, Grow in Christ, and go in Christ. Welcome. For all of us, I invite us to take out the connection cards and complete those. If we know you, put your name on it. If we don't know you, give us as much information as you're comfortable giving us. Do note the prayer requests on the back. It was funny, just this week I called somebody over one of those prayer requests and said, wow, people actually read those? Yeah. We read those, every single one of them, and pray over every one of them every week. A um, couple things going on in the life of the church. One of them you got a little insert. We're going to do a picture directory again. It's been a few years. We're all a few years older. But, uh, some, but, but seriously, it's a fantastic thing for new people and to connect us into the community. So we're going to do a picture directory. This is how you can sign up for your time slot to get your picture taken. It is super simple. We're going to do it on our website. Um, and so connect there. Uh, it also, there is a movie night this Saturday night. Number of people are. This is it's going to be a kids movie, Zootopia, um, and a lot of people want to need a kids movie. But think, if there's anybody in your life who you wanted to connect to the life of the church, any kids, grandkids, somebody you know, it might be a great opportunity for invite. It's going to be real simple. Saturday night, free popcorn in the gathering place. Um, part of no grow and go is that we love for every person at Westminster to have one worship service they're connected to. One discipleship venue, whether that's a life group or a, or a men's group or whatever that is for you. And one place to go, one place you are serving that you can say, hey, that's my mission right there. The, the green sheets this week, I'm not going to read them all, have some really neat go opportunities. Let me invite you to read through those. And if you don't have your go right now, prayerfully consider, might, might one of these be my go? Think through that. And last... All right, this is just going to be a personal request, guys. This summer, uh, we've done things just a little bit differently. Um, you know, we're not wearing the robes because it's hot in the summertime. I've actually gotten some really positive feedback about that. Last year, we got some positive and some negative. If you have opinions about the robes, whether to wear a robe or not wear a robe, let me know. All right? The whole purpose of the outfit is, is, is to make worship conducive for everybody who's here. Also, a couple weeks ago, because of Vacation Bible School, we didn't have the pulpit. And I got a couple of people who said, boy, I kind of liked it without the pulpit. Barnabas, you, you didn't look like you were afraid to fall backwards. <laughs> you might not know I live with that fear. But, but if you have an opinion about having a pulpit or preaching from the lectern, then let me know that too. You know, nothing is written in stone around here. We, the whole purpose is to help connect us to God through Jesus Christ. For the Holy Spirit to flow in us and through us, for us to connect to God and anything we can do to make that work better. That's what we want to do. Let's start this service with a word of prayer. God, may this service today be more than words. We say words, we pray words, I preach words, we read words, we sing words. Lord, may it be more than words. May your word come to us. Your word incarnate in Jesus Christ your living word in scripture. May you speak a word into our lives that we can be your word to the world. That's our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to invite us now to rise and let's share in our call to worship. From Isaiah 51. Joy and gladness is found in the Lord. God's salvation will stand forever, and God's righteousness will never fail. 
Let's sing hymn 21, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. in wonder, love, and praise. I love that hymn. Take away our bent to sinning. Yeah, we still have that one, don't we? Let's come to God with our prayer of confession, admitting our need for His grace that we may be lost in wonder, love, and praise. We'll pray first together and then on our own. Let us pray. Gracious God, shine your light into every corner of our lives. May your love transform our relationships. May your truth enlighten our thoughts. May your justice direct our actions. May faith invade our fears. And may humility conquer our pride. God, we need your light because we shroud our sin in darkness and hide our brokenness behind a smiling mask. Shine your light within us and heal us that we may reflect your light to the world. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Amen. Friends, hear this good news from God's Word. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Yeah. 
filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Today, our, our sermon text is about a slave and a slave owner. And so, in our prayer hymn, we're going to pray a hymn that was written by a famous slave owner who changed all that when he gave his life to Jesus Christ, John Newton. The hymn is Amazing Grace, 107. Today we don't have a rose, but the, we did have a birth this week. Sarah and Steve Badke, well, Sarah did all the work, uh, had her beautiful daughter Amelia Rose this last Thursday, and so we celebrate that with them. Let's come to God in prayer. God, as, as we sing that song, Amazing Grace, Boy, there's so many concerns in our lives. There's so many concerns in the world. There's so many frustrations and fears. But right now, I just want to say thank you. Praise you for your amazing grace. God, you loved us so much that even though we ran away, even though we split up your kingdom and called it our own, you still loved us. And through Jesus Christ, you came to call us back into your family, to call us children of God. You came, Jesus, you came to die, to pay the price for our treason and to rise again, that we might rise again. You brought life to this dead world and offer us eternal life. God, May we never forget to be amazed 
by your grace. May we never forget to sing that it saved a wretch like me. May we never forget that it was grace that taught our hearts to fear that we know sin only because of your grace. And we know forgiveness and love only because of your grace. That you have been with us every single step of our life journeys, even when we're scared, even when we're sinning, even when we doubt, you're with us. And all the people outside these walls, the 76% of Medford who do not know you, you're with them too. And you love them. And you want to invite them to know your amazing grace. And you use us. Boy, you have a calling on our lives to invite them to know your amazing grace. Help us never to stop being amazed at your grace. Help us to live every day toward that day, 10,000 years from now, when we're still praising your name. When we're looking back on the preschool we call this life. And we're seeing what you did in our lives and the, seeing the ways that you used us and we're seeing the lives that were transformed and seeing the people who are singing alongside us because of your grace working through us. Help us to live every day toward that day. Help us not to get distracted. The fears and worries and concerns, the tribulations of this life, they're just not even worth comparing to the glory of that day. Help us never to lose sight. Help us never to lose awe. Help us always to be amazed by your grace. That's my prayer today, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for it. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, we're coming toward the end of this Little Jim's sermon series that we're doing this summer. Right? Teaching on the, on the less taught on books of Scripture, the little books, the little gems. Today, I'm going to be teaching on the book of Philemon. Philemon is the last of Paul's letters in our Bible, and it's the shortest. And in fact, those are connected uh, in a Greek library, was organized by length. And so Paul's letters go not chronological order, but from Romans to Philemon, sort of an order of length. Uh, so Philemon is the very last one just before Hebrews. This letter, it's part of a story. It's part of an absolutely amazing story of two men named Philemon and Onesimus. And you have to understand the story to understand the letter. Onesimus was a slave. And I know, as soon as I say the word slave, we're all thinking of the American South, right? Slavery in Bible times was just a little bit different. Um, in fact, it's different enough that my translation, the ESV, even calls this bond servant instead of slave. Uh, slavery was not racial back then, right? The horrible sin of American slavery is that we considered some people subhuman because of their skin color. Uh, that was not the case in Bible times. Uh, slaves were the same skin color as everybody else. Um, and also, it wasn't necessarily generational. Slaves could marry, could have families, could have children, and their children uh, would not just be the property of their slave owners. Um, slavery often happened because of debt, which means many slaves could actually get out of slavery if they worked their debt off. And many slaves actually became free, they got emancipated, but then continued to work in the very household. The slaves were considered a member of the household. In fact, their whole economy was based on these households. Uh, our word economy comes from the Greek word for households, and slaves were part of those households. So it wasn't quite like slavery in the American South, but still, it was slavery. Right? Slaves had no rights. They could be bought, they could be sold, they could be abused, they could not leave. So it was, it was still slavery. And according to some estimates, in some parts of the Roman Empire, over 70% of the population 
were slaves of one kind or another. The whole economy was based on this system of households, including slavery. Onesimus was a slave. In fact, his very name means useful. Can you imagine giving your kid the name useful? I mean, it sounds like a slave name, doesn't it? It's probably because his parents were slaves and they probably expected him to become a slave even though slaves didn't have to become slaves. Someone who was born to a slave didn't have to become a slave. They didn't have a whole lot of career options either. So they expected him to become a slave and can you imagine growing up with the name useful? Your whole life you know what's ahead of you. Slavery. And the best anybody could hope for you is that you'll be useful. That's all in the name Onesimus. Onesimus lived in Colossae. Remember the letter to the Colossians that Paul wrote? His owner was named Philemon. We can assume Philemon was wealthy. Uh, We know that he had a household. He was head of a household. He had slaves, right? So he would have been a, a wealthy person. And somehow through the ministry of Paul, Philemon came to faith in Jesus Christ, became a follower of Christ. In fact, more than that, we we learned that that the church in Colossae met in Philemon's house. So he was known as a a Christian leader in this area. And Onesimus was one of his slaves. I don't know how he treated his slaves. I can hope that being a Christian made him a kinder, gentler master, but he was still a slave master. And sometimes, some people separate their business world from their faith world, and that should never happen, but sometimes it does, and and I don't know what Philemon was like to his slaves, but we do know this. One day, Onesimus decided to run away as a young man. He didn't just run away. He robbed Philemon in the process. He stole money or valuables. He stole what he could, and he ran away. I'm done being useful to these other people. I'm going to be useful to myself. But God had a plan for Onesimus. And somehow, we really don't know how, the Holy Spirit had directed his situation so that Onesimus ran into Paul. Can you imagine that meeting? Onesimus on the run. We don't know where it was. It was in a different city, right? Maybe in Ephesus, maybe as far as Rome. We don't know, but he'd gotten away. And then he hears the voice, well, hey, Onesimus, fancy meeting you here. And Paul took Onesimus under his wing. He was a mentor to Onesimus, to this runaway thief. Paul showed him the same grace that God shows every one of us. And Onesimus came to faith in Jesus Christ through Paul. Turns out that was pretty handy for Paul because Paul got thrown in prison. And we don't know what city this was in because Paul often got thrown in prison. Um, and so, uh, but in prison back then, they didn't just feed you. You had to have someone who brought you food and supplies and that sort of thing. And, and Onesimus was one of the people who helped Paul out. But the day came when Paul said to Onesimus, but I'm, I'm, I'm writing a letter back to that church in Colossae, your old hometown, the church that meets in, in your old house, Philemon's house. And, and Onesimus You've done him wrong. And I think you need to make it right. I think you need to take this letter to the Colossian church and and I think you need to to reconcile with Philemon. And I'm going to write him a special letter just for him to let him know that you're now a brother in Christ, to talk about your transformation, talk about how useful you have been to me and to invite him to reconcile with you. That's the letter to Philemon. It's the letter Onesimus carried with him to his old master as he, a new believer in Jesus Christ, is going back to reconcile with his old master. Can you imagine the courage it took for Onesimus to carry this letter back? Runaway slaves were not treated well in the Roman Empire. Right? Any empire that depends on slavery for its economy is going to be pretty hard on runaway slaves because there's always the fear, what if all the slaves realize they're doing all the work around here? In in the Roman Empire, a common punishment for a runaway slave was to brand him on the face. 
In fact, if, if an owner was particularly vindictive, he could have the slave executed. And the way they executed runaway slaves was the worst form of execution they knew of, the cruelest form of execution they knew of. It was crucifixion. Crucifixion was reserved for treason in the Roman Empire. And a slave who ran away, it was considered treason against the economy, against the whole society, because the whole society was based on slavery. They didn't want those, Rome, those slaves to run away. And so as a slave owner, Philemon had a responsibility to make sure to discipline his slaves severely. That's what their culture said. But Paul knew, and the gospel said something very different. The gospel said we're called to love one another. The gospel says we're called to reconcile to one another. If someone has wronged us, to forgive. If we've wronged someone, to apologize, to seek reconciliation because the ministry of Christ is to reconcile us to God and also to reconcile us to one another. That's why Paul wrote this letter and invited Onesimus to travel back with both this letter and the letter to the Colossians with another Christian brother, Tychicus. Actually, both of them are mentioned in Colossians to come and bring in this letter to go reconcile with Philemon. Can you imagine what was going through Onesimus' head on the journey back? What's going to happen to me? Right? What's Philemon going to say? What do I say? What could Paul say in this letter to somehow make this right? Well, let's, let's look at what Paul said in this letter to Philemon. It's only one chapter. He starts off, uh, basic greeting, Paul and Timothy to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. Uh, you know, we're all workers in the gospel. And to Aphia, our sister, probably Philemon's wife. And to Archippus, our fellow soldier, that maybe that was Philemon's son, maybe that was the pastor of that church, because he goes on to say, and the church in your house. Paul's writing this letter, and he's addressing it to Philemon, but, but it's also to the church in, the, in their house. So often we try to keep our little sins private. We try to keep our disagreements private. Paul knew better. Everybody would have known what Onesimus had done here. Because I bet Philemon let them all knew, that son of a, you know, that good for nothing, that scumbag, he stole, you know, right? As soon as it happened, I bet Philemon would have let them all know what happened. Pray for me. Yeah. So it wasn't just a private thing. And Paul gives a, you know, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard that before. You know, a regular thanksgiving for him and prayer for him as, as they normally do. And then in verse 8 is when he gets to it. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now indeed he is useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a little while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Wow. So here's what Paul says. He says, hey, Onesimus has put his faith in Jesus Christ. He has become my child in the gospel, right? I became his father. Um, he, I'm, I'm, when I'm sending him back to you, I'm sending my very heart to you, right? So Onesimus means a whole lot to me. And he's, I want you to receive him. I don't want you to receive him as a runaway slave. I want you to receive him as a brother. Receive him even as you would receive me. So he's calling him to reconcile. And I love how Paul says it. All right? Because he says, you know, I'm not going to command you to do this, though I could. <laughs> right? I just want to give you the opportunity to do the right thing. 
So I'm going to tell you the right thing. And I'm going to encourage you to do the right thing. Oh, and by the way, down in verse 22, he says, Oh, and, and prepare a guest room for me because I'd like to come visit you sometime just to make sure you did the right thing. <laughs> this guy know my parents? Because that's kind of like what they would say to me. You know, hey, we're not going to make you do this. We're just going to tell you what it is and encourage you to do it and then check to make sure it got done. Right? That's what Paul says here. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's a great technique. And then Paul addresses the theft. Here in, in the next verse, uh, verse 18. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, and Paul knows what Onesimus did. Onesimus has told him, right? It's not an if. But, but if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me even your own self. Now this is an amazing statement here. He invites him to forgive. Right? He invites Philemon to forgive. To let it go. But if he still owes you anything, if it takes money to bring you two back together, charge it to me. I'm writing it with my own hand. Most of this time he, he would dictate the letter. But this one he writes with his own hand. I will repay you. If it takes money to bring you two back together, I will pay the money. That's an amazing statement, guys. Right? It matters that much to me to have you two restored. Um, now, a suspicious Philemon might say, yeah, and, and how's that going to happen, Paul? You're in prison? Right? But that's when Paul says, to say nothing of the fact that you owe me your own self. Yeah, you know, you also came to eternal life through me. So I'll tell you what, if he owes you anything, just, just take it off whatever you owe me for that eternal life there. Yeah. Or tell you what, even if I don't get back to you in this life, I'll pay you back in heaven when the money just won't matter. See, that's what I love about this letter to Philemon. That's what I love about this story of Onesimus and Philemon, is it's a laser focus on just what matters. And what matters in the kingdom of God is reconciliation. It matters more than my rights as a slave owner. It matters more than my rights as a free person. It matters more than getting someone back for the wrong they did to me. It matters more than whatever they stole from me. What matters in the kingdom of God is reconciliation, is forgiveness. And that reconciliation, that forgiveness is so important that Paul is willing to send Onesimus back to his former slave owner. I mean, look at what Onesimus is risking here. He's risking his life for reconciliation. He's risking getting branded on the face for reconciliation. He's risking the very real possibility that he'll be put back into slavery for reconciliation. Because according to the kingdom of God, by the values of the kingdom of God, reconciliation is worth it. The money that was stolen is temporary. My rights are temporary. Even slavery itself, my freedom is temporary in this life. Because in 10,000 years, when we've been there 10,000 years, those things won't matter anymore. What matters is reconciliation because that is truly eternal. Are you getting this, guys? From the perspective of this world, this is crazy. Why on earth would Paul tell him to go back to this guy to be reconciled? This is crazy. But from the perspective of the kingdom of God, it matters. It matters that Philemon has the chance to do the right thing. It matters that Onesimus has the chance to do the right thing. It matters that the two of them can be reconciled not as owner and property, but as brothers in Christ. This event, this very real physical event, is part of the gospel story in their lives. Did you know that the very real physical events of your life are part of the gospel story? They are. I'm not sure we can even understand this because we live in a culture that breaks relationships just so easily. You see it in business contracts. 
People break business contracts if they think they can get away with it, sometimes even Christians. You see it in marriages, sometimes even Christian marriages. You see it in churches. Oh my goodness, the things that people leave churches over. I mean, sometimes it's just, oh, I like the programs better over at that church, so I'm going to hop that church for these couple of weeks. And then after I get upset with them, I'll hop church again. Some people get upset by little things. Some of us know of someone in this church who got upset at the time that the ushers let people in the doors in Sunday mornings. In a previous church, I know somebody who left a church because when they built the fellowship hall, he wanted hardwood floors and they put in carpet. He left the church because he put money into that building and they, couldn't, they should have listened to him. Friends, that's not the way of Christ. The way of Christ says reconciliation is more important that being brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ is more important because the ministry of Christ was a ministry of reconciliation. When we changed denominations, we did a whole series on what is the gospel, what are our key beliefs, because leaving it anything less would not be a Christian action. Do you get how important reconciliation is to the gospel of God? Because that is the story of the gospel. Guys, I need to ask you a question. What reconciliation needs to happen in your life? Is there anybody in your life who's upset with you? Anybody in your life you're still upset with? Any relationship that is broken? What reconciliation needs to happen in your life? That might be part of the gospel story of your life. Sometimes we're in the position of Philemon. Somebody else has done us wrong. And if so, we need to forgive. Right? We prayed earlier, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus goes on in the very next verse, it's Matthew 6, 14, that if you forgive others their debts, your heavenly Father will forgive yours. But if you do not forgive the debts of others, your heavenly Father will hold yours against you. Because if we aren't forgiving others, then we have clearly not gotten the gospel of grace. If we realize what amazing grace that God has forgiven us with, Forgiving others is a natural next step. But what if it hurt? What if it really hurt? Well, of course it hurt. That's why we call it sin. Right? Forgiving people does not say it didn't happen. Forgiving people does not say, oh, it didn't really hurt. No. Forgiving says it hurt. It really happened. I had real losses here. Any time somebody hurts us, we have losses Right? Philemon lost a, a member of his household. He lost trust. He lost the money. Right? He may have lost respect in his community. He, he had real losses here. Forgiveness does not pretend that didn't happen. Forgiveness says, I have those losses and I'm going to charge that loss to the cross. I'm not going to charge it to you, Onesimus. There's no way you could pay me back anyway. I'm going to charge that loss to the cross. In the letter to Colossians, and I suspect Paul intended Philemon to hear this one too. Letter to the Colossians in chapter 2, Paul says that all of our sins, have the list of sins against us, have been nailed to the cross. It's a beautiful image. Every single sin you have ever committed or will ever commit, it is written down on a list and nailed to the cross. And that's true for every sin you have committed and every sin that's been committed against you. Do we realize the amazing grace of God? If we do, we realize that this sin that's been committed against me, it hurt. It caused losses. But I'm going to charge that loss to the cross. It's been nailed to the cross. Jesus paid for it so we can be brothers again. When we're in the position of Philemon, it's our calling to forgive. But sometimes we're in the spot of Onesimus. Sometimes we're in a position when someone else is, wrong, is, is, is mad at us because we've wronged them. And i got to tell you, as hard as it is to forgive, for me, I think it's harder to admit I've done wrong. Because I always have really good reasons for doing wrong. I can come up with all kinds of excuses of why they deserved it or why I needed to do it or why they made me do it, right? I'm alone in this. None of you ever come up with these excuses, right? 
Boy, I can rationalize any behavior I do. But if you think you have excuses, check out Onesimus. All right? It'd be pretty easy for him to say, it's not fair. That Philemon had so much money, he didn't need this money, and I did. It's not fair that I was born to slaves. It's not fair that I became a slave. It's not fair that I was named Onesimus so that I had to do but become a slave. This whole system of slavery is just not fair. And you know what? He's right. If you ever have a reason or excuse, let me tell you, Onesimus had way more than you will ever have. And yet, stealing is still wrong. All the excuses added together don't change the fact that what he did was wrong. And if we've done someone wrong, it's our calling to make it right. It's our calling to apologize and try to set it right. Is there anybody you need to apologize to? Is there anybody whose relationship is broken because of something that, that you did? Now, maybe you think it's 90% their fault and 10% your fault. Okay, forgive them the 90%. Apologize for the 10%. Maybe it's 99% their fault and 1% your fault. Okay, guess what I'm going to tell you to do? Apologize for the 99%. Forgive the 99%. Apologize for the 1%. Now, if you apologize, then you've got to figure out what to do with that relationship. You can't make that person forgive you any more than Paul could force Philemon. Now, and there's some people who are just not safe. There's some people who are not healthy enough to have healthy relationships. They may be abusers. And in that case, you may not be able to reconcile, but you can do your part. Maybe mail them a letter might be safer, but whatever it takes, do what we can do toward reconciliation. Sometimes we're in the position of Philemon, sometimes we're in the position of Onesimus, and sometimes, sometimes we're in the spot of Paul where there are two people we know and maybe people we love who are at odds with one another. There's a brokenness in their relationship. And everything in our culture says, keep your nose out of it. And everything in us says, oh, I don't want to get involved. But the gospel says different. The gospel says the ministry of Jesus Christ is to reconcile us to God and to reconcile us to one another, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. I love what Paul says here. Hey, if it takes money to bring you two back together, I will pay it. That's a remarkable statement. I heard a story of, of, of three sisters. Mother had died, these three adult sisters, and, and apparently had left these three sisters different things, and, and two of the sisters were fighting over who'd gotten more. And the third sister said, I'll pay the difference out of my share. How much is it? And the two sisters did all the adding up and they added it all up and they said, it's about $300. Yeah, I'll pay $300 to have family harmony. It changed their family. When, these sister, when one sister was willing to pay the price for those other two sisters to get along, I'll pay it. Sometimes we need to be that person. Hey, if you guys need family counseling, I'll pay it. If you need marriage counseling, I'll pay it. What does it take to help you two come together? Sometimes our calling is to be Paul. And I know it's so tempting to just want to support these two people separately, right? Sometimes people need that support. Sometimes people just need a hug. And sometimes people need a thump on the head with the gospel. Sometimes people need to hear, hey, reconciliation is what this gospel's about. Reconciliation with God. Reconciliation with one another. What if we Christians were known as the people of reconciliation? What if we Christians were known as the people who forgive first? What if we Christians were known as the people who apologize first? What if we were known as the people who work for reconciliation in the world? What a witness that would be to Jesus Christ. What reconciliation do you need in your life? And what are you going to do about it? Now there's a problem with the book of Philemon. There's a big problem. And the problem is simply this. We have the story all the way up to the point where Onesimus has this letter in his hand. And then the problem is, what happened next? Right? I want to know the end of the story. 
Did Onesimus take the letter to Philemon? Did Philemon welcome him back into the family? Did the church welcome him back? Did they brand him, execute him? What happened? Well, I believe we have two hints, two important pieces of evidence about what happened next. This is a little bit of speculation. You need to hear it. But here's two pieces of evidence that I have of what happened next. First piece of evidence is the fact that we have this letter to Philemon. If Onesimus had taken that letter and said, thanks, Paul, and then run the other direction, we never would have had this letter. If Philemon had taken this, read it, and ripped it up, we never would have had this letter. No, we have this letter, as we have all of the New Testament letters, because the churches were sharing them back and forth to one another. They, were, um, they, they made copies and shared them with other churches. And the only way that the Colossian church could have made those copies is if the Colossian church had seen this letter. And the only way they could see this letter is if Philemon himself had brought the letter to them, probably with his arm around Onesimus. Let me tell you the story, Philemon says. And all of them knew the part where Onesimus had run away and robbed him. But now they get to see the story of forgiveness, the story of reconciliation. And somehow that Colossian church had to welcome Onesimus back into the family as well. Guys, this is, Jesus told the story of the prodigal son. He made up that story. Philemon and Onesimus is a real-life prodigal son story. The runaway slave who comes to faith in Christ and then comes back to reconcile and is welcomed back into the family. Both the family of his, of his paterfamilia, the, the household father, but also the family of the church. Boy, what would that story have done for that Colossian church? Of course they shared the letter because they shared the story the story of reconciliation that happened in their very midst. Do you think your life could have a story like that? A gospel story? I want to know what that story did in that community. Because it would have been a scandal to all the other slave owners. Right? Oh my goodness, he just took him back? He didn't charge him, he didn't brand him, he didn't execute him, he didn't even force him to, to, to work out even the rest of his life in slavery to pay off this debt? What? Well, how do we know this guy's not just going to rob him again? How do we know his other slaves aren't going to do it to him? How do we know my slaves aren't going to do it to me? See, this story of Philemon could really rock the boat in a system de de developed on slavery, and in fact it did. The letter of Philemon in America was one of the abolitionists' favorite letters. Yeah, the story of the gospel rocks systems of domination, it transforms lives, not just individual lives, but systems and societies as well. I suspect it was a scandal in that Colossian community, but how would it have been heard by the 70%? By the slaves, by the servants, by the others who suddenly hear, hey, those Christians believe we're not property, we are people. Those Christians believe we're made in the image of God too, and we're all called to be brothers in Christ. What a witness to the gospel is the story of Onesimus and Philemon. It would have been known in their community how it could have transformed their church, how it could have transformed their lives. It's a witness for eternity. I think all of that is true because we have the letter to Philemon. But if you're skeptical, if you think I'm reading too much into that one fact, we have one other piece of evidence. That several decades later, we have a letter from St. Ignatius to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was the nearest city to Philemon. St. Ignatius was one of the great leaders of the early church. And um, at one point, he was thrown in prison for it, just like Paul had been. And he writes a letter to the Ephesian church, St. Ignatius to the Ephesians. You could look it up online. And he says in this letter, hey, your bishop came, and the bishop's the, sort of the head over all the churches in the city. Your bishop came to visit me, and he is a great guy. He is, he says, a man of inexpressible love. Ignatius says, I pray you would all seek to be like him. And the bishop's name was Onesimus. Let's pray. God, help us to be more like Philemon, one who is ready to forgive. Help us to be more like Onesimus, who has the courage 
to admit when we're wrong, and to do whatever it can to set it right. Help us to be like Paul, to bring people together and reconcile to point to you, and God, help us to be more like Jesus, who gave up the comforts of heaven to come to earth, that we might be reconciled to you. We pray in his holy name. Amen. In response to all that God has given us, we have an opportunity to give back. We'll now bring the morning offering and we can put our connection cards in the offering as well. Gracious God, we were all runaway slaves. We took a grab hold of the parts of your kingdom that we had in our hands and we called them our own. But we've returned to you now. And as part of our tribute, we return to you just a tenth of what you've given us. Use it for your kingdom because you are our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Boy, I'm tempted to sing that when Jesus Christ be praised, man. That's awesome. But let's uh, amen to that, right? We're going to sing 551, There's a Church Within Us, O Lord. <laughs>
Friends, with whom do you need to reconcile even this week? To whom do you need to apologize? To whom, whom do you need to forgive? Whom do you need to bring together? If you have any prayer need for yourself or for someone else, we have a prayer minister right over here who would just love to speak and pray with you. Friends, go out into this world as the runaway slaves who have been brought back home, as the ones who have received God's amazing grace and who have the calling to show it to the world. Amen. Amen.